I'd like to call the regular meeting of the California Board of Aldermen for January 12th, 2021 to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands. stands on the nation. Under God. God. So smooth. All right. Roll call, please. Alderman King. Alderman King. Here. Alderman Stubb. Alderman Foot. Here. Alderwoman Tar. Here. Alderman Cassetti. Here. Alderman Genetti? Here. Alderman Spigarolo? Here. Alderwoman Stroman? Here. Alderman Yalman? Here. Alderman Rivers? Here. Alderman Mamone? Here. Alderman Short? Here. Alderman Blackwell? Mm. Just out of here? No. no. So. Okay. Alderman DeLibro? Here. Both present and two absent. I declare a quorum. Uh, before we open the public session, I want to add one item to the agenda that you, you received it. Uh, late communication number one from AJMA LLC. Yeah. All right. Uh, public session. Anyone from the public who wishes to speak tonight? We didn't do the minutes. I'll do those after. Okay. We can do them now if you want, but I, I was already. I'm just following through. the agenda. That's all. Go ahead. Uh, I'll okay. All right. Got well, that typo, Diane. <laughs> all right. We can do the minutes first. Uh, we have the minutes of um, the December eighth organizational meeting and the in the December eighth regular meeting. We have a motion for the December eighth organizational <laughs> minutes. So moved. Motion by Yaman. Second. Second. Second by Rivers. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? I'm All right. staying. I wasn't there. Okay. One abstention. Mamone. Uh, motion passes. And then uh, we need a motion for the December 8th regular meeting minutes. So moved. Motion Aye. by Yaman. Second by Mamone. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions on that one? All right, motion passes, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, all right, moving on back to uh, public session. Uh, would anyone from the public wish to speak tonight? Either raise your hand in Zoom or blurt out if you're on phone. Second call, anyone from the public who wishes to speak tonight? Third call, anyone from the public who wishes to speak tonight to the board? Seeing and hearing none, I close the public session. All right, public official session, Mayor Cassetti. Good evening, President Short, members of the Board of Aldermen, residents of the great city of Ansonia. Or should I say President Stewart? Oh wait, that's a Mike Makoism. Speaking of Mike Mako, Mike wrote his last article as a reporter for Hearst Media. It was a great article. If you haven't read it, you should. While I wish Mike good luck with a new chapter in his life, I, or we, will miss Mike's articles, his wit, his humor, his insightfulness, and intelligence that came through in every article he wrote. He was a sports nut, especially as it pertained to Ansonia in the Valley. Last week, he wrote his last report after 45 years in the business. Mike has a gift and a talent that was not wasted on the media. He wrote stories from both sides accurately and honestly. He asked questions. He was not biased. He didn't shy away from things even if they went against the bias of the, today's media. Mike was a warrior for the residents of Ansonia and the Valley and certainly a rarity in these times. He is a lifelong resident of Ansonia, and we are so very proud of him and his accomplishments. 
Tonight, I would like to make this the Mike Mako story. He deserves it. I would like to present Mike with an award on behalf of the city of Ansonia. Mike, we love you. You have been a true friend, and we hope to see you more now that you have retired. Congratulations. And I got a plaque here, and it, I'm not on the computer tonight because something's wrong with my computer, but it says, Mike Mako, in recognition of your lifelong contributions as a reporter that have enriched the lives of Ansoni and the Valley residents, we thank you. From myself and the Board of Aldermen. So, Mike, if you're listening, tomorrow come down and receive your plaque with your key to the city. Next Thanks, Monday, congratulations, Mike. <laughs> Next Mayor, Monday, we. Mayor, I hope you spelled his name wrong. Yeah, no, I, 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 took it, I took it off the monument, uh, President Short. <laughs> no, I, I spelled it right. But listen, next Monday, we celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was above all else a proponent of peace. His words continue to ring true. The bust outside of City Hall is a constant reminder of his leadership. With the new year comes renewed hope and new challenges. I know that the city of Ansoni and its residents have withstood many challenges over the years on the football field and off. And we have not only risen above, but we have distinguished ourselves as champions in more ways than one. I am here to tell you that Ansonia continues to move forward in a positive path, stronger than ever, you will hear more about finances from our new chief fiscal officer, Kurt Miller, later in the meeting, who will discuss our financial picture in the budget season. Work is continuing at our new PD station. Soon you will see brand new windows on the completed exterior of the building. You will hear more about the building from staff. The ATP and Palmer buildings are being renovated to accommodate the new residential units in commercial space. Design plans are 100% complete and ready for 497 East Main, 153 Main, and 165 Main Street. You may have seen pictures we posted on Facebook overlooking the new segment of the Riverwalk, which will begin in a couple of months. That project will connect to the Main Street and will provide an added walk to our popular river walk. We have a new addition to our eateries called Charged Ansonia Frozen Shakes. A good name, huh? And I hear the shakes are delicious. You will hear more updates about ongoing projects and grants from my staff. We just completed demolition of 6 Luster Street. In the meantime, our firefighters were able to participate in fire training drills on the old structure this past weekend. Two nights ago, I swore in the new fire chief, Dan Mudry, and the new assistant chiefs. We wish you good luck, Dan, and everyone, and we thank Mike Eamon for his years of dedicated service. We are proud of our Ansonia Fire Department. Keep up the good work. Many of you have asked when City Hall will be reopened to the public. Believe me, there is nothing I would like more. We are awaiting guidance from the state, Naugatuck Valley Health District and Griffin Hospital, and others to be able to do so as quickly and safely as possible. I want my residents to be safe as possible and our employees as well. I assure you, we will continue to work on ways along with my Board of Aldermen to continue to provide services to you while we wait to reopen. As always, my virtual door is always open. Please call me if you are experiencing difficulty or just to touch base. I took the job because I love Ansonia and its residents. I remain committed to helping. I also want to thank our Board of Aldermen tonight. These men and women are sometimes not given the credit they deserve. They work behind the scenes, attending countless meetings, talking to their constituents, talking to me and my staff to resolve issues. I thank the board and I am excited about the new year together that will bring an even stronger and better Ansonia. Please stay safe. God bless you all and God bless the city of Ansonia. Thank you, Mayor. 
Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, Corporation Council, John Marini. Uh, members of the board, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, thank you very much. Um, quick update. We're one down, two to go with respect to our major contracts we're negotiating. Um, thank, I thank this board again for getting together at our special meeting to resolve our uh, City Hall uh, clerical contract. We're now moving on to resolve the Public Works contract and also our City Hall supervisors contract. So you will likely uh, hear more on that in executive session at next month's meeting. Uh, in addition, we're in the process of resolving a series of solar tax appeals that involves Ansonia and a multitude of other towns. These appeals have actually been consolidated by the courts, and we're about to enter into our first discussions to see if there's an opportunity for settlement. That's something that's going to be headed your way, so don't be surprised to see some uh, materials in the next month or so. Uh, we're working on updates to the City Hall uh, personnel policy. And that's being done in conjunction with both the mayor's office and, of course, our finance department and uh, fiscal officer Kurt Miller. Uh, we'd hope to have something um, ready by early uh, mid spring. So uh, look forward to that conversation. Happy to say that this week or early next week will be the closing on the SHW property currently owned by Pandel. And of course, that's paving the way for a demolition and revitalization project. Um, so you could expect to hear that that closing has occurred sometime very shortly. Um, regionalization, we talked about a potential re uh, regional redevelopment corporation that we're looking forward to proposing. And that's on the horizon in the short term. Um, we are reaching out to staff in the surrounding communities and we hope to give a formal update at the next meeting. And by way of public service announcement, Vaccinations for individuals over 75 years old are beginning at Griffin Hospital and the mayor's office will be reaching out to the public. We encourage our aldermen uh, to do the same. Um, there, there is some need to be signing up online. So to the, to, the, to the extent that our residents may need our help accessing the programs, logging onto the computer, and the mayor's office wants to make sure those resources are available and the word is getting out there. Um, that's it for now, but we have uh, several matters in executive session to dive into later tonight. Great. Any questions for Corporation Council tonight from the Alderman? Hey, Mr. Marini, I have a question. Um, around the COVID vaccinations, are we required or is there any sort of list of folks that have received it or do we have any stats on the number of folks uh, at this point? I, I've seen online a couple people that have been vaccinated, but do we have any idea how many you know, numbers of folks in the, in, in the city have that have received the vaccination already? We could reach out to Griffin to get a status update. And I think also, you know, Valley Health and uh, CDC may be uh, helpful in providing that those statistics overall. Yeah. In terms of okay. our city staff, I think it's important to note that we've already put out a survey to um, city personnel to identify those that are in close proximity to the public on the front lines. Yeah. to ensure that our city personnel are being vaccinated. Um, but I, I do think, I agree, it's helpful to, to know what the situation is citywide. We'll look if we can get that information out this week uh, from the mayor's office to both the board and the public. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. Any other questions for Corporation Council tonight from the Alderman? I, I did have one more. So, um, Mr. Marini, on the closing that you had referenced earlier, you mentioned that the, the, dem the demo piece that was included there. Is that scheduled, uh, the demo scheduled just yet? So, in, some environmental issues had to be resolved before the demolition could occur. Uh, okay. Sheila can go a little more into depth on what those are. Um, but the big prerequisites here are the title transferring so that the city owns outright the property. And so that's happening next week or so. And again, it needs to be an environmentally ready to actually go forward with the demo. That means that the environmental agencies have to give us a green light. Sheila could talk about what more needs to be done to get there, but I would say we're closer than ever and uh, gearing up for that. Perfect, thank you. All right, any other questions for a corporation council other than I'm up on? Or a third one from Tony? That's it. No, I'll, hold, I'll hold them for Sheila. Okay, uh, Economic Development Director, Sheila O'Malley. All right, thank you, Mr. President, members of the Board of Aldermen. Um, yeah, if we go back to SHW for a second, 
the um, it's actually our preference to own it before we demolish because it becomes a more valuable piece of property once demolished. But that really, as John said, that really isn't wasn't the uh, the only issue. The issue is um, removing the excavator that's in there and some additional cleanup that EPA would like done, uh, which we are doing and should have done shortly. Um, but when you remove that large piece of equipment, there's some issues with the with the roof. So um, it's not it's not a simple process. It may take a little bit. Um, but that's that's essentially where we are with SHW. Um, Somebody left there an was excavator a lot. there. I'm sorry. Somebody left an excavator behind. Yes, somebody who did a partial demolition for us. Um, there was some asbestos on that uh, equipment, and that needs so it's it's remained in place. It needs to be cleaned, and the surrounding area has been cleaned. But that that. Um, equipment needs to be cleaned and moved out out of there um so that is that uh, the mayor mentioned mike mako's article and that was about ansonia copper and brass largely about that and the draft um, master development plan which we call the north uh the north side revitalization plan and um that plan uh has indicated that the extrusion mill, which is a 165,000 square foot building on the Ansonia copper and brass parcel um, is, is a building that can be salvaged. And so we are um, continuing conversations. We had conversations with our state delegation and we have been uh, in conversation with the United States Economic Development Administration about ways to secure funding to renovate that building. Um, it's gonna, it, it's, a, it's a large project, but I believe it's a good first step on that site. Um, that is probably one of the only salvageable buildings on the site. Um, 497 East Main, 153 Main and 165 Main. Someone had asked me if those were gonna be separate addresses and I thought they were, but actually I stand corrected. I think they're all gonna be 153 Main and 165 Main Street. So those three properties will become those two addresses. And the owner um, contacted me and we, uh, I referred them to the building department because they're ready to pull the construction permits this week um, or as soon as possible as, as the owner uh, Vasilius said. Um, today. So that's, that's happening. Um, I think uh, Mayor talked a little bit about the Riverwalk. We had the engineers out there. We'll be coming to this board to award the apparent low bidder um, once we get approval from DOT uh, that the department is okay with our recommendation to award it to uh, the low bidder, which is Schultz Corporation LLC. Um, but that will be for the next meeting. And then, um, and then whenever they can mobilize this winter or spring, depends on the, the time schedule, the schedule and the, uh, the cost. Um, Alderman Schuert and Alderman Yalman have been asking about the um, floors in the fire stations and in particular, um, Eagle Hose. So, and a structural engineer will get in contact with Chief Nimmons um, this week. We, he'd like to go out there on Thursday potentially to take a look at that floor and move forward with whatever needs to be done at his recommendation. So um, your efforts have not gone in vain. We'll be looking at that. Um, I want you to be aware that Tenor um, Corporation, Tenor um, Company will step in for me as the um, as a member on the PD building committee, uh, you know, and they'll they'll be doing that permanently. So they will be my replacement, and I just wanted this board to be aware of that. They will be attending every meeting that occurs on my behalf and our behalf. And um, I think that's all I have for now. Any questions? Questions for economic development tonight. 
Yeah, Sheila, I have I have one. Um, the, yes, sir. The, the soccer field over at, um, you know, Olson, that the plans for that, where is the, the application in the HUD process so far? Is that application gone? is at the, has been submitted to SAC as of last week, which is a special application center. Everything's been submitted. Um, they have the consultant that we, that we partnered with uh, is, feels comfortable that it's a 60 day turnaround. Uh, they or they think they can get a 60 day turnaround. So that puts us in at March okay. um, for, for uh, what we believe to be uh, is going to be a positive response to our application or to the housing authorities application. And then uh, we will begin um, talks with the we have been speaking with the developer, but we will be uh, making some more concrete plans and coming before you to do so. So does, does the, the title or the deed transfer at that 60 day point or shortly thereafter? Or do we have other things and applications to, to satisfy? Um, special application center will just, will, HUD will uh, essentially just release the property and say, you can, you can transfer the title of this property. You okay. have permission to do so. So okay. they're just Good. granting permission and then mm -hmm. the title will transfer at a closing. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Any other questions for Sheila tonight? One, I, I have <laughs> one, Sheila. With regards yes, to um, 165 Main, 153, and the construction that's going on over there, under the contract, yes. there were certain time parameters. So I was just curious as to whether or not we are on track and who has their finger on the pulse. Yeah, um, I, I believe, and John knows a bit more about the the actual stipulation or clawback, but that's a good question. And they had a, I, I believe they have a two year period to complete this first phase and yeah. they're well ahead of schedule in terms of that. Um, yeah, we're on target I, in terms of actual uh, work beginning as interior demolition has already commenced and approvals, approvals have been given. So we're pretty satisfied with the timing. And at this point, it's just identifying whether or not there are any obstacles uh, that could get in the way of a speedy resolution. But on that first piece, you know, progress has begun and actual work is being commenced. We look forward to the exterior demolition and uh, improvements, but conversations we've had with respect to, um, you know, developers and, and getting their designs in order um, seem to be going well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Sheila tonight? Yeah, I, I have one. And yes, Diane. Alderman Phipps had um, asked this question before, but I'm, I'm still not clear of the answer. Um, regarding the soccer field that Tony just uh, referred to, um, yes. is that a done deal? Is that, is that once the land turns over, it's, it's definitely going to be a, a soccer field? Or are there other options still well, out there? Well, I can clarify. Um, I think in, with respect to the process, the, um, the proposal has been received, but an agreement for the actual facility has not been finalized or approved. And so it's our anticipation that once, these, once the, uh, the application to SAC is approved, as we anticipate it will be, the city will be able to purchase the property. And at that time, we'll enter into a negotiation in earnest um, with the developer for the proposed facility. And approval of that project depends on approval by this board of an agreement, um, of a development agreement of this facility. And again, we haven't gotten to that point yet because it was all moot until we, can act, until we knew we could actually purchase the property. Um, so this was done in advance, of course, in order to get a light at the end of the tunnel to see what, um, what potential use there could be, as that certainly helps drive the application to purchase. In Your fact, without, without the knowledge of what was going to be done with the property, it may have been, it may not have been possible to, to apply you, to successfully you, get it. You must, you must submit an end use for the special application center to, um, to award or grant the transfer of title. And we, as I explained last month to Alderman Phipps, the city had a formal bid process we went out to bid pending the transfer of this property. Um, we received bids back and we awarded 
uh, the bid <coughs> pending pending the transfer of the land. So the bid was reported. Go ahead, Diane. Is that what I heard you say, Sheila? It was awarded. Okay. Yeah. We, <laughs> yeah, we just did not begin negotiations with the with the um, developer. Okay. And, the, and, the, and as John said, those. Yeah, there's Those a difference terms. between winning a bid and, and resolving a, a, an agreement or a contract, similar to the, um, the ATP Palmer buildings. A bidder is selected and then a negotiation occurs. And of course, that bidder gets the project if the agreement is approved, if, if the negotiation results in an agreement that is approved by both sides. So, you know, we've narrowed the scope to a developer that we'd like to negotiate with. And we did anticipate picking up that negotiation once we get a granted application and a purchased property. I would also point out that the developer has invested some money towards this effort with preliminary site plans um, and engineering. Okay. Listen, I've, uh, I've gone, uh, uh, I was the one that brought this up last month and, and as near as I can tell from the documents that were available online, um, the board in September of 2019, uh, had the issue in uh, executive session and that's where it le that's where it was that's where it's been left which means that nothing's been done on it officially and um i know you have an rfp uh um and then there was some issues that were mentioned in the media i believe on um valley indy on some of the he the, he had an interview with uh uh, Primrose, um, Mr. Gettys, and uh, you know some of the things that were being thrown out there were, you know, it's not going to be a freebie to Ansonia, and um, he wanted to have some tax considerations to invest in that. In other words, to my to my understanding, it's not a done deal yet by any stretch, and um, that's um, what. What do you mean? But, what What do you mean? Uh, the board of aldermen could very well turn it down because the board that's in sitting right now is not the board that had it in September. That, that, that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean anything. And it I mean, did if a board, if a board makes a decision, it is the decision. The board has not made a decision, a decision unless I don't have the paperwork. It was yeah, an executive okay. session and it never came out. Therefore, yes, it, it, it dies. Well, yeah. It did, I want to it see did come out of executive session and was voted on. I'm waiting and, to see documents. I think Mr. Marini promised that he, he could secure some documentation uh, that it was indeed done. But on the internet, you know, that's all I could do. I couldn't get to City Hall. It dies in September. September of 2019, just before the... Like I said, there's no... You know, the statement, is it a done deal? Of course not. There, there has to be a negotiation and an agreement between the parties. So, you know, anything being said at this point about incentives and, you know, what the purchase price would be, oh, that's, that's reserved for a conversation once the city actually secures the property. So in that sense, I think, you know, everybody's right here. This, this is something where we're on a course to, to, to negotiate with this developer, but no, an agreement is not in place yet. That's something this board will take up. As, per, as long as the, of course, the application is approved and we're able to purchase the property as anticipated. So it will come back for a vote, basically. Of course, I mean, there is no agreement right now on the, the table. Vote, what would you, right. what, yeah. Well, the no, vote would be on the agreement. Exactly, exactly. So we would go Because back. you can't go out to bid and tell someone that they are the apparent um, a winner of the bid and mm -hmm. then go back and say, oops, sorry, we're not, we're not awarding the bid to yeah, you. For, for clarification, so that, the intention that not wouldn't to, be proper. there's no intention, you know, the mayor's office does not want to engage in another bidding process. We have someone that's at the table. Yep. We're waiting the completion of this, you know, the application and the purchase, and then we would like to begin a negotiation. You know, the final deal is subject to an agreement on terms, and we haven't been discussing that because, of course, we want we don't want to put the um, the cart before the horse, so to speak. We need to make sure that application is approved and we secure the property, and then this board will be weighing in on um, terms of an agreement. 
Well, it's, it's a discussion then for another day at this point. Definitely. Uh, another question for uh, Sheila. Did uh, I? Did, you said you you dropped off the police commission, building commission, and you're being replaced by someone. Uh, Tenor Construction Company is our owner's rep, and they're going to be sitting in on the meetings. Um, I will participate at you know um, at some point, but uh, they will be the point people asking the questions on our on the city's behalf. Okay, understood. Other Sheila questions? and John, you may want to update the board on what's going on with the senior center. Yeah, and what, Diane, you know, I, I wanted to do that and I, I know we have a meeting coming up, so I was I was gonna hold off until that meeting, but uh, it's after this after this one. But we are um, we are talking with uh, Diane and the senior center members and Jeff Coppola and Mike Marcinic. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled for next week to discuss the, um, the design plans and the budget. Um, and so we will be coming back to this board with those plans once the, the um, Diane and others have reviewed them and made comments. Um, and then we will, uh, we can bring that, we can bring all that back to this board as well. It's next week. Am I right? Yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And we'll see the updates next month. You will see the updates next month. And then, you know, it's a matter of uh, just approving the design and moving forward with the construction. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Sheila tonight? All right. I just wanted to say thank you for your responsiveness, the city's responsiveness on those uh, fire issues, the, the flooring um, and the siding, um, fi finishing the siding on Hilltop as well. So you guys have been very um, responsive. So being a pain to you guys is, has been successful. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Dad, don't spread that around. Yes, yes, it has. So jo Josh was just not getting a, not himself, a recommended, basically. Not a recommended technique, but um, <laughs> it was a success this time. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Police Chief Andrew Coda. He's here, I saw him somewhere. I'm, I'm here. Good Hello, evening, everyone. Um, I'll give you a couple of uh, quick updates. Uh, currently, we have uh, two officers that are out on light duty. We've got an officer that's in the field training program right now. He was a certified officer that I told you about last month. He's begun his field training. Everything is going well with him. We continue to uh, show him the ways of Ansonia, you know, get up to speed on our policies, procedures in the city itself. And uh, we expect to see him on his own in, in a few more weeks, hopefully. Um, his name is David Acosta, if I hadn't already given that to you, uh, former officer of New Haven PD. So we expect to utilize his talents within the city of Ansonia. Um, recently, we made some arrests. You might have seen it in the paper for the uh, two burglaries on Main Street, um, one at the uh, Subway store and one at another at the Polish restaurant on Main Street. We were able to make an arrest on that, took the party into custody. Uh, we had some training in December. We had uh, rifle training, rifle recertification, and rifle certification for our newer officers. So they're all up to snuff. We expect to um, be doing some more training in the in February and March also. Uh, we submitted a budget to the city, working with uh, Kurt Miller on that. And uh, we're also working on uh, reviewing some other certified police officer applications at this point um, to fill some spots that we have open. So we're gonna continue with that process uh, as we move along and, and keep the board apprised of uh, how we're doing there. Um, that is the uh, information I have for now, unless someone has any questions. Um, I, well, actually I should add to, to that, the, uh, the police building moving along as we started speaking about, um, they've got quite a bit done in the inside and the main portion of the building, the top floor, that's uh, going well. Some uh, UI has connected some of the electricity. So there's temporary um, full power outside, but temporary uh, lights and such on the inside. They're working on getting that going uh, to full status. Hopefully by the end of the month, we'll be uh, up and running and they'll be able to um, charge up our heating and ventilation systems to make sure that those are all working correctly. 
Um, the gas company has uh, given the okay for the gas lines up to the meter. That needs to be installed. So they're working on that. And as you can see now, if you drive by, a majority of the outside of the tower has, uh, has been enclosed with um, some weatherproof material. Obviously, that's not the final material, but that will get us through the, uh, the cooler and colder winter months to at least get that area secured. So they are, they are moving along on that project. Um, when you do go inside, it's uh, each week there's a little more that's completed. It's, it's really starting to look like a, uh, a finished building on the inside. Lots of sheetrock. Um, you can see now all the windows are removed from the building. They're putting the framing in to uh, get the new glass installed. Um, they hope that's over the next, I believe, three to four weeks that we expect you'll start to see uh, that uh, probably complete, hopefully, but they are moving along, uh, taking care of that also. So uh, some major movement on, on the building. It's going along well right now. And I'll uh, entertain any questions if you have any. Any questions hey, tonight? Yeah, Chief, yes, it's Tony. I do the uh, the new um, self service Uber, i.e., car thefts, uh, seem to be increasing a bit. Um, any thoughts on that, or any sort of uh, ideas on how we can, uh, you know, drive some of those numbers down that I've been reading about? Yeah. So, so uh, unfortunately, that seems to be statewide. I don't know if you saw. There's an article in in Berlin today. Yeah. Same thing. Every every city is dealing with it. Um, what we're seeing is some of it is uh, cars being left cool months always. Uh, cars are left unlocked. Cars are running. They're taking them. Uh, many were recovering quickly. Um, we've made a, a few arrests, but it, it seems to be a, a band of, uh, you know, juveniles, uh, you know, young, late teens, early 20s that are moving around, taking uh, opportunistic chances at, at getting into cars. Uh, we're aware we are working with some other towns to see if we can identify these individuals, uh, but, but we are... Uh, we have to be careful because of because of the juveniles you saw in West Haven. They had that just two juveniles um, were arrested there uh, when they had this police vehicle they took and uh, uh, ran over two officers. So yes, each department is aware of it. We are working with other departments to try to uh, continue to drive these numbers down, but we're we're paying attention to it um, and just trying to. It, it's kind of everywhere. I, I can't say well it's one particular section. It's they drive around to one car, drop off people, they check. And then yep. they're off in, in other vehicles. So yeah, our detectives and our officers have quite quite conversations with other departments, and uh, we've got some some stuff that's out at the lab. Hopefully, we can get some returns on that and get some arrests. So we are we are working on it, and very well aware of it. But we very still good. ask, like we always do, ask people please lock your cars, don't leave your cars in or your keys in your cars, especially with the key fob systems. Um, do the best you can to secure your property. But um, again, if you see anything out of the ordinary, anybody in the neighborhoods. Let us know. We'll go check it out and, and follow up from there. All right. Thanks, Chief. Tell you guys to stay safe. Thank you. Any other questions for the Chief tonight? Chief, I have, I have, I have one or two, uh, if you don't mind, really quick. Uh, just briefly, um, if you could provide an update for the uh, those robberies that happened on the west side. Um, I've gotten a couple of inquiries as to whether, you know, how far along and how the investigation is going. And secondarily, is have you received any additional um, guidance from the state of the financial impact of the police accountability bill passed last year? Now, to the first one, we are still waiting for some items to come back from, from the lab, hopefully to give us some more information. We have some leads, um, nothing, nothing solid at this point that gets us far enough. So hopefully the, the information we get back from the lab can help us push those, those couple of cases over the edge. But uh, they are on our radar to try to get, get resolved there. Um, as far as the police accountability bill, um, the, the ones that I do know, uh, one is the officer wellness exams. Uh, we did get a price from our, our uh, employee assistance program, and it's about $200 per officer. Um, you need to do 20% of your department uh, each year to, to keep up with the numbers. So that's about, about $2,000. We, we assume 10 each year. Um, so that's about $2,000 a year for those. We're getting pricing estimated we're still waiting for a firm number for the drug testing at about 250 dollars per officer for recertification um expectations are about 13 officers per year to get recertified to the cost of about 3200 dollars and then the uh the one that we're waiting for a final number um but we're working with our, our body cam company because we've had them for uh, almost six years now um that's going to be the big one we're looking probably at close to a uh a $40,000 a year increase to get these uh, in-car cameras 
the, the, the in-car cameras and the additional cameras into, into our officers' hands so that they can comply with the, with the law. Uh, but we've not gotten a final quote for all of that in, until we're working with the company to try to get us a final quote. But that's about where we, where we expect it to be. I've, I've submitted those as preliminary numbers in the budget to uh, kind of make uh, Mr. Miller aware so he knows what's going on. And, and as we get more information um, that may be subject to change, we'll, we'll talk more about it. But that's what we have now. There's other, some, some other training considerations, but we have um, ways to go about that through, through training time and officers' um, schedules being switched and stuff. But uh, again, guidance is coming from the state slowly but surely, and we continue to uh, work with that to stay updated and, and in compliance. Is that is that forty thousand dollars? And just a quick, just quickly, is that is that for the installation of new cameras um, or into the, the car cams? And is that does that encompass sort of the storage? I know there's there's a there's a bunch of uh, in order to get it to the cloud, there's a fee associated with that, um, or however it's backed up on the server. So yeah. The, so, oh, sorry. So so that includes everything. That would include okay. the installation into the vehicles, the storage, the access to evidence.com. Same thing with our body cameras. It would give us the extra body cameras that we need to outfit every officer. Um, so that's that's where we're, that's in addition to what we're paying now. We pay about thirty nine thousand dollars a year uh, currently for that. But that that's a a turnkey package. That's everything. I don't have to go out and get more to get storage. That's part of the entire process and the install into the uh, vehicles. Also, thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Any other questions from the alderman for Chief Coda? All right, thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Um, how about uh, Dr. DeVaca, Superintendent of Schools? I saw he was here tonight. Would you like to address us? I, I would, thank you, uh, President Schuert. Thank you, uh, thank you to the alders. Uh, first, I'd like to tell everyone that I, I recently sent out a letter um, regarding our reopening on the 19th. Uh, schools should be coming back in, in a hybrid fashion for two weeks. And then on February 1st, it is our hope to get students to come in all in. All in might look different um, at different uh, levels, pretty much kindergarten through the middle school. You'll be looking at four days a week in the high school, five days a week. And the high school will be a uh, half day. Um, the early, early release at 12, 12, 20, 12, 30. It's um, the major issue is because um, it, it's hard for me to socially distance and, and adhere to some things when it comes to lunch. So they're going to do a grab and go lunch at the high school. And um, it's very similar to a lot of the surrounding communities, what they're doing at the high school level. But based on our surveys from our families, um, they have been our families and everyone has been unbelievably patient regarding uh, schooling uh, remote. They've been helpful, but it's um Nothing beats having our kids in, and we're going to try our best to get our, our students in safely, our staff safely. And uh, with that said, uh, our staff is on should be on tap for Phase One B. Um, we've sent out our surveys and have done our our planning as well, uh, rolling out um, that. Supposedly, um, we look like um, the end of January, uh, early February, our teachers should get the first round of um, vaccinations. If and hopefully. You know that that goes out um, moves wonderfully as well, and we're going to give ourselves a good six weeks of um, the way we're opening up. And if we can, by the middle of March, if things are going phenomenally well, we hope to have a full reopening of, of all of all grades, all buildings. You know, K K to twelve, and that's depending on what our world looks like. It's, it's also very tough with an 11% positivity rate today. So um, we're, we're going to try. We've done things pretty safely in our buildings and we're gonna, we're gonna work on that. And uh, I, I commend our staff and our administrators, especially our families in the community. Um, it, it's, been a, it's been a road, but everyone's been helpful. Uh, I do want to also point out, I will be having a facilities meeting uh, actually Thursday. And some things we're gonna be discussing is the move of our pre-K students to the elementary schools. Presently, our majority of our pre-K is located at our middle school, which is probably not the, the best model. Um, usually you want a one-to-one -one transition. You want your pre-K students to transition to kindergarten 
It makes a lot of sense um, for our pre-K students to be located at the elementary levels. And with that said, sixth grade will then move to the middle school. Presently, we have a junior high model in place, uh, getting our, ourselves in, in line with if regionalization was to occur or if um, we were to uh, have to have our own middle school. Um, ed specifications clearly show that the educationally sound model is a six, seven, eight uh, middle school and uh, the state does not fund seven, eight schools. They, they, they will fund a six, seven, eight um, school. So uh, trying to get ourselves in position or in line um, for uh, funding when that becomes available, depending on what the will of the community and regionalization, um, what that pans out. I also just wanted to add, I think uh, potentially it, it looks like the uh, potentially the next secretary of education in our country, um, uh, Mr. Mer Miguel Cardona, I think the only positive thing he has visited Ansonia twice. And I think, um, and I hope that it puts us in a uh, benevolent and advantageous position for, for us going after some other, other funding at the federal level. So, um, which I'm, I'm going to stay relatively positive about and, um, hopefully when I call him, he answers, but, um, but that being said, um, I, I'm here to answer any questions um, that anyone could have. And um, please, I, I'm here for you. Any questions for Dr. DeBacco tonight from the Alderman? Yes, I have one. Yes, Chicago. Yes. How you doing, uh, Doctor? And Happy New Year to you. Ha Happy New Year to Chicago. Great job you're doing down there. Um, if, if the positivity rate in Connecticut um, keeps going up, what is the percentage that you would go back to all our remote? You know, it's funny that you have asked. It's um, what I'm fighting and struggling with is that there are some communities that have never, who have never gone remote at all and they've stayed open the whole time. And we've only shut because of staffing. And I've looked at that positivity rate and what I'm thinking is, and this is, if I can't safely staff my buildings for our, our students and our families, that's when I look at closing. So the positivity rate, uh, I mean, it's, it's around the state. So I don't have an exact number, but if I can't staff our buildings and keep it safe, I, I will look to, and I, I will shut it down. Like I did around uh, the Thanksgiving time, um, but the the other issue I kind of struggle with Chicago and, and all the and all the alders is that there are communities that have never closed and they have been open in the the entire time. And first of all, I also know that they've also put probably not the most certified people in front of students, and I'm not willing to do that. I want to make sure that there's a certified person in front of kids at all times because I want to make sure they're getting an education. I'm not here to just say that we're open just for the sake of being open. I wanna be open where they're learning. So um, so Chicago, I don't have an exact number, but if, if it's not safe for our kids and our community, uh, I, I won't hesitate to shut it back down. That's actually why we are, we, we're starting hybrid and we're going to a four day for the majority of the district because if I have to pivot and I have to shut it down, we'll have to shut it down. So um, I'm, I'm trying to keep that Wednesday as a, as a pivot day still available for us. Thank you. And, and President Short, if I could just add, add one more thing, I have to be very thankful to the uh, Alderman. I just want to let us at the facilities meeting as well. I forgot to bring up that there are two items that we will probably be coming to uh, to the Board of Aldermen probably next month asking to uh, look at that non-lapsing account. We have a chillers that we need to purchase at Ansonia High School and at Prendergast. Each of those chillers is probably close to $150,000 each. Had we not had a non-lapsing account, I'd be asking uh, the alderman to either bond for about $250,000 to $300,000 with the chillers for our air conditioning system or, um, or ask for additional appropriation. I think for us being you know, fiscally responsible and being able to put money aside for one-time single purchases, this is a, a, a prime example of, of being fiscally responsible where we're able to um, be able to do this with the help of uh, the Board of Aldermen by having that money aside. 
and not having to ask the community or the board of aldermen for more money. So um, you will see that, but I have to say thank you in advance because that's exactly what um, the non-lapsing account should be for is those one-time uh, payments of uh, non-reoccurring costs. So um, I just wanted to share that as well. Great, thank you for that update. Uh, any, any other questions? Last minute questions for Dr. DeBacco? Just a comment, myself and the taxpayers appreciate that financial uh, responsibility, doctor. Absolutely. Thank you for coming tonight. You got it. All right, on the, on the uh, note of uh, financial responsibility, we'll move on to the uh, chief fiscal officer, uh, Kurt Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my first report to you folks last month, uh, I understand was a, a bit long and a bit dense. Um, so I've cut that down dramatically. So if there's any areas that I don't cover, please feel free to, uh, to let me know. Uh, with regards to the budget process, uh, most departments have submitted their budgets. Uh, those that have not will be given till this Friday. Uh, if their budget is not uh, submitted, their consideration will not be given to their own budget and we will create it for them. Um, if they can't take the time to submit their budget, then quite honestly, we probably don't want to listen to the opinion that they have on their budget. So. Um, there is a delay in processing of the grand list um, and the timeline for the budget has changed. And I'll talk about the grand list itself in a few minutes, but I just want to review the change in the timeline. Uh, I don't think it is responsible uh, of me to present a budget to the mayor for his review and consideration without a full understanding of where we are on the revenue side. <clears throat> so the new dates will be as follows. The preliminary draft budget will be set for Monday, February 8th. The 90% draft budget is expected on for Monday, March 1st. And the projected presentation of the mayor's budget will be Tuesday, March 9th. Um, the capital planning, uh, the five-year plan and the annual reoccurring plan will be included in that presentation. So you can expect uh, to see those. Uh, in front of you this evening, I know it was forwarded on, um, are some policies uh, and procedures, uh, a policy and procedure guide, uh, excuse me, a policy and procedure manual, and then also some financial guidelines. So I'd like to go through the financial guidelines uh, first. There are three specific areas, particularly uh, when you look for the rating agencies, uh, what they look for, and that is fund balance. The second is debt service, and the third is how you're handling your outstanding uh, legacy liability. So how we're dealing with our uh, retiree costs. So the first is a fund balance guideline. Um, I know that you currently have one in place, uh, but what I wanted to do was recommend uh, putting a plan in place if for some reason you are to fall below that. Uh, so you can see on the uh, page that I've provided for you, um, the, uh, the goal of the number that we want to achieve is 12%. Uh, I think for any city uh, or town in Connecticut, that's a very realistic number. And then, but until we get there, we need to build steps in. So you can see there's an 8% step, a 10% step, and a 12% step. The reason you put the steps in is it locks those in place. If you fall below the step, then a plan needs to be created and you can see it needs to be signed off um, by myself and, and both and then with final acceptance from the alderman within three years to bring us back above that number. So right now we currently sit um, in our uh, undesignated uh, fund balance. Um, and if that were to come down uh, below 8%, uh, once we cross that, then we need to put that plan in place. So you can see those different uh, steps. The second part is the debt service goals. Um, again, uh, S&P says that for a community to be healthy, um, the debt service ratio, which is the amount of principal and interest payments you're making towards your overall budget each year, should be somewhere between 6 and 8%. They consider that a healthy community that is reinvesting in itself between eight and 10%, they start to have some concerns. Anything over 10%, um, there better be a very good reason why 
uh, you're taking on that much debt. The city of Ansonia currently stands at 2.81%. So we are very uh, solidly in uh, the, the lower range. Uh, the one question that S&P and the other agencies will start to ask is why is it so low? Why are we not making reinvestments um, into our community? That's where the debt policy and procedures manual comes into place. That is kind of a step-by-step -step guide of how we would consider taking on debt and the process that we would follow. Uh, again, a lot of this uh, increase, potential increase in our debt ratios will be tied to our long-term capital plans, which we are in the process of creating for your consideration. Uh, so it all ties together. But I think it's very important that we have the policies and procedures in place before we start to build these plans. We wanna make sure that the checks and balances are there uh, so that we can show true fiscal responsibility. Um, so Mr. President, I don't know how you want to uh, have the board uh, take action on this, but I think it would be uh, a, a very strong statement to the rating agencies and to the other financial um, institutions that will be reviewing the city, whether it be now and in the future, that these policies and procedures are approved by uh, the Board of Aldermen that we can refer to minutes of a meeting to show them that um, yeah. you know, this, is, this has been acted upon uh, by the board and it, has, it also has the endorsement of the mayor. So I will leave that uh, to you to, to discuss. Um, the city, as you know, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, okay. regarding the, uh, the first document here, um, I think we'd probably do them together. I mean, endorse them together. And I can, I can answer any specific questions on either document if everyone, if Does anyone has any of those questions. Does anyone have any questions on that first document, the financial guidelines? I have it up on the screen right now. That's what he just covered. I, I have just a quick question. There yes. is this brand, is this a new document for the city or is this an updated document for the city? Um, oh, uh, Oliver Shrumman, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of both. Uh, you do have an existing policy, particularly on fund balance. You have fund balance targets. Um, you, you know, you, you would like to keep your fund balance overall around 11%, uh, your undesignated fund balance around 8%. Mm -hmm. But I'm not aware of anything specific that is on paper. I'm sure there is. I just haven't been able to come across it. But what's new um, are the steps that are being put in place. Mm -hmm. So as you climb above, so let's say we get up to 10% and you decide that you want to use fund balance for whatever reason. Let's say it's the purchase of fire truck. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take $500,000 to bring you down to, let's say, 9.5%. What this says is that we need to put a plan in place to get us back up above the 10% level within three years. So okay. those are the things that the rating agencies like to see, that we take the fund balance very seriously. They do understand that from time to time, you're going to need to use it for outstanding needs but they wanna see that you have a, a specific plan in place to get you back above that. So this is kind of a combination of old and new into one we'll call okay, new document. Thank you. Heard I have a question. Where yeah. are we right now in terms of the percentage of the overall fund balance? <clears throat> uh, overall, you're at about 11.1% .1 on about 7.8, 7.9 undesignated. Um, so you're right there in those numbers. Right. Um, and again, so, that's, so achieving that 12 won't be hard anyway for us right now. Well, what we're going to use oh, for not. this uh, for this guideline and it is going to be undesignated okay. again because money that's designated it's assigned or attached to something else. It's still cash that right. the city has, but it's it's set aside essentially for something else. So okay. we're going to stay focused on the undesignated number. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on, on this document? Kurt, just what you just said. So we're using undesignated as our guideline, but the, what you, the fund balance guideline here that it seems to read for the overall fund balance right. and the last line seems to indicate including assigned, designated, undesignated, as well as balances and debt service. So I guess for, for purposes of, is this what the, is this guideline being put out because that is the action that is taken with the overall 
while we're trying to work on the undes or the de the undesignated? I guess I'm just looking to try to. It's it's when S and P asks the question, they'll ask for your fund balance. They don't necessarily want to break it down fully. Um, so again, they would look at the overall balance. Um, okay. But again, I think it's it's prudent for us. And and again, if it makes sense to change the wording on that. Uh, we can certainly go ahead and do that. Instead of it saying overall fund balance, we could say undesignated fund balance. If you feel uh, that's a little bit more, um, I, I, way I, to asked, do it. I guess I, I guess I was asking the question because it seems based on you know you're saying that the undesignated is about is sitting at about eight um, percent between that would require us to immediately work on that plan to start us moving in an upward direction under this if that is what we're using as opposed to overall fund balance which if that is sitting between um 10 and 11 we really don't have to adopt a plan with, with it not falling below that 10 percent that required in the th in the third prong that requires the plan building so that's, uh, that's the only reason i bring it up yep no, if, if to look at it that way that is that is correct um so again, it's it's entirely up to you how you want to do this. But if we go with if we leave it as overall fund balance, then we based on the whole amount, the eleven point one. Um, if you want it focused on the undesignated, then we would need to change uh, that that term. And I'm to be honest, I'm I'm comfortable either way. If we move it to the undesignated, do the do the thresholds change? Uh, I, I don't believe so, no. Okay. So by including the designated portion, it almost artificially inflates the percentage. If we're, if we're kind of framing this, Kurt, around what we want the undesignated fund balance to be, if we're including the overall piece of it, including the designated, I would say it's going to artificially hit some of those targets for us, which, you know, I think is bad in two ways. One, if you have designated funds that you haven't spent yet, you know, once you do turn around and you allocate those and expense them, it's going to drive that number down and you may be reaching back for a, th a threshold that might be unattainable within that three year time frame. So I, I kind of like the undesignated portion. Um, the, the undesignated piece, what I'm, I'm not familiar 100% right off the bat is the designated versus the undesignated within that 11.1% that you quoted or 11.9, whichever it was. So do you mean what what would example of something be? Is that is that the question? Dollar amounts, basically. Uh, the, oh, the dollar amount undesignated four million five hundred eighteen thousand two hundred and fourteen, and designated one million eight hundred eighty three thousand nine hundred ninety six. Okay, so you're about an eighty twenty split ish. So right now, what is our percentage undesignated? Seven about seven point eight. That's what I was trying to get to before. So we're we would have to grow to the twelve before we would be where this document wants us to be. No, no. If, if you notice the steps, the first step is an overall fund balance falling below eight percent. Right. No, but I was saying. I'm sorry. Optimally, though, you're saying we should be at about twelve, but that what would only be right now is if we include everything correct correct so then i think we need to look at it in terms of just what's undesignated yeah. right yeah so, I, I like the undesignated portion with the percentages that are there kurt because if we're at around a, a little over a, a, a little over or a little close to eight if you will right now as an undesignated portion we're, we're kind of at we'll say yeah a, a point where we're comfortable we don't really want it to drop too much more and we need a plan to at least get it back to the, get it up to the eight point. Um, while I say, you know, I think there's a thing in here. I think Joe, you were alluding to that because it's not at eight, you know, we don't have to put the plan in place, but I, I kind of disagree. I kind of say, Hey, let's, let's set the table here. It's 8%. Let's put a plan in place to get back there within the next three years and then continue to grow at it. Even, you know, once we put the capital plan in place as well. I agree, Tone. I mean, I'll, ju I'll just say this, is that my, my, my point in bringing that up was that with an overall fund balance, we actually are above the threshold and do not need to create a plan. Correct. When you're yep. talking about an undesignated threshold, we are uh, slightly below and would require us to be a plan. But one point of clarification, Kurt, just so I completely 
uh, grasp grasp what this is doing is that if we're below eight percent, we're putting ourselves on a three year plan to get back to above eight percent, right? That's correct. And then and then step two would kick in at that point in time, whether or not we achieve that sooner or below whatever it is. Then we have we're falling below nine percent, so now we're on a three year track to achieve that nine percent. Is that how I'm how I'm reading this? Yeah, it's eight, ten, and twelve. Well, I see the I. I is it is that what we're trying to achieve? Because it says the minimum level over a period, and I'm reading two different levels. I'm reading yeah. at the time the fund balance reaches 10, balance is falling below nine. Correct. So, so if it falls below, so I, I'm reading that to, to read that once we get to 10, we don't have to grow any further because we're between that 10 and 12. That that that's I guess that's the two numbers there um in each sentence is that I'm I'm reading the first one to say if we're below eight percent, we got to get to eight percent. Then once we get to 8%, I'm reading the second one to say, because we're below 9%, we got to get to 9%. And then I'm reading yeah. the third one to say is that because we're below 10%, we got to get to 10%. Am I reading that wrong? Well, you're kind of looking at it the wrong way. Think, okay. think of those as lock-in amounts. If you cross the 8% threshold, and let's say you're at 8.2%, yeah. there's no pressure to put any plans in place. At that point, you could slowly grow your fund balance and continue to do that until you get up to 10%. Once you cross the 10% mark, then bullet two kicks in. That's your new norm, so Joe. If you fall back below 9%, then you're required to do this. Okay. Oh, okay. So so it's not, it, we're not creating a mandatory every time no. we reach that that step. No. We're upping, upping it a little bit more and, and telling ourselves we got to go into another um we have a little bit more flexibility after we reach that minimum eight percent correct you okay. guys have a very normal fund balance i mean i would think most cities in the state of connecticut are somewhere between eight and twelve percent i mean that that's very consistent what this is doing is just putting some structure to your fund balance this is this is not being put in place because there's any concern with your fund balance i think your fund balance overall is quite healthy um, and I would argue that it's actually quite good for a distressed municipality. All this is doing is just putting some structure to it that if you were to use fund balance for whatever reason was deemed by the mayor and the board of aldermen, that there's a plan in place how you would get it back to that specific level. That's all. The rating agencies want to see that there is a commitment to doing this. Now, you have maintained this level uh, for the last few years, so they'll see that consistency and they'll appreciate it. All this does is just give them um, a, a put, concretes it a little bit more in their eyes. We've maintained that level while other communities around us have dropped. Correct. Right. Correct. So, I, I mean, I'd like to see it read as undesignated as well. I agree with Tony there. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can make that motion if we need it. And Josh, I'd like to throw them out separately if we can. Okay. So, right. um, I guess I'd like to see then a motion. Um, Let's see. Let me see what the title of this thing is here. It'd be fund balance guidelines. Yeah, so a motion to um, to authorize the chief fiscal officer to adopt the financial guidelines uh, as discussed with the with this, with this, with this update uh, to change the overall fund balance noted in option one to undesignated portion of fund balance. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, motion by, and can I can I add a piece to that? No. Um, do we need to authorize the mayor to uh, to endorse that as well? Yes. Okay, so, and you know, everything that Tony said, plus, and, and then further authorize um, the mayor to, to endorse it. First by uh, Mamone, second by Tar. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, great. Um, so that goes through. And then moving on. Right, so uh, second one would be the de debt service goal. Um, again, uh, the SCP rates a healthy community somewhere between 6 and 8%. Um, you guys are... Uh, substantially lower than that. So th the concern is municipalities taking on entirely too much debt. That is not a concern of the city of Ansonia. 
Uh, so that's why the, the, it says no more than 6%. So essentially, you could double your debt capacity and still be within your uh, debt goals. Doubling your debt capacity would spike the mill rate, which is something that we just don't have a need to do. Um, so again, uh, again, it's just a commitment to how the city will move forward with taking on debt and reinvesting in itself. And to be honest, the 2.9% or 2.81% to be exact that the city of Ansonia sits at, I can tell you is the envy of communities all around you. Sir, I, I know we rolled off some debt. What portion of that 2.9 or what portion of the police station is in that 2.9 already, if any, or if all of it? Uh, at this point, none of it is in there. Okay. Do we know so, what that's going to look like after we roll that in? Uh, you're probably 9.9. Um, .9. You're probably going to go up to about 3.8, 3.9, give or take. Okay. All right, but so again, it's, it, it's a percent. It's the principal and interest payments based on your overall budget. Yep. So the assumption is the overall budget is going to continue to grow. Uh, each year, but you your debt payments are, are designed to stay level and decrease. Right, and debt rolls so, off as well. So. Correct. Got it. All right. Correct. I'll make, you know, if there's no objections or any mm -hmm. questions, I'll make that motion to um, update the guideline for uh, the debt policy and procedures dated January 12, 2021. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mamone. Is there a second on that? I'll second that. Second by uh, Tar. Any other? Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kurt. Sure. And then the, the final one is the OPEB trust fund policy. Uh, OPEB is the outstanding liabilities that you carry on your books that have to deal with the cost of retiree benefits uh, other than pension. So it's an astronomical number that towns and cities carry on their books. Most towns and cities, just like the city of Ansonia, do a pay as you go. Um, some towns and cities set up these uh, OPEB trusts. They put money in and after 10, 15, 20, 30 years, the fund builds up enough money so that the interest that is inside of the fund can pay for those reoccurring annual expenses. I don't know how many towns and cities actually are able to do that as of yet because these numbers are so high. For a lot of communities, it's multi, multi-million dollars, 20, 30, 40 million dollars of liability that they technically have on the books. But again, it's looking at the potential costs of an employee who's 25 years old, been with the city for four years, and what his or her expend, expected benefit costs could be 40 years down the road. Who knows if that employee is still going to be with you? So again, it's, uh, uh, it's something that looks good to the rating agencies, a uh, place that you're starting to put some money away. But again, it's a savings account that you can basically never touch. And we, we do not have anything in place today for that, correct? We currently do not. Okay, so it's more or less a, like an accrued liability that we're, we're building towards that fund. Okay. Now, this is one that, um, you know, if it's, a little, if it's too soon to do something like this, that's not a problem. It's something we can revisit next year. I think the two important ones are one and two. So if the board is not comfortable with this, would like to hold off, um, waiting till next year would certainly not be an issue. Is the expectation you're going to get that fifty thousand uh, dollar contribution in this budget cycle coming up, if this gets approved? Um, I yes. Okay. Do you know what that what that outstanding liability on the balance sheet hanging is now? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not. Um, okay. I want to say it's, I don't know if, if Richie's on, uh, he would probably know, but I would venture to guess it's uh, north of 30 million. Okay. All right. Well, this, this is obviously something, this is, again, it's, it's future planning. It's something to be, to be prepared for. So I, I am going to make a motion to adopt the 
OPEB trust fund policy as noted in the, uh, this was the fund balance guideline document, correct, Kurt? That was the name of the document? Yeah, uh, just financial guidelines. Can I just financial... get one question before we go forward? Sure. It, do we have to do both? Do, can we start it with that 50? Because it also talks about up to 25% of the prior year surplus. Correct. But you never know what's going to happen and you don't want to lock yourself in to having to put that away if god forbid something happens and we're in huh, a pandemic mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean I, I don't know that we want to lock it down to 25 percent of a prior year's surplus because what if we need to allocate money somewhere else we and well, we're just starting this off maybe we started off with that 50 and then revisit that second half of it another time i don't know well hey, that's... Hey Bobby, that 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 surplus assumes that you know your your budget target for the following year was not only achieved but you exceeded that and, and you did have a surplus left over so a portion of that so that that surplus today goes back to the fund balance so what we're saying is take that take that surplus that's coming back and allocate a quarter of that towards you know the future liability that we're going to have to incur yeah no i get that i just I don't know. I just hate when you're starting something new to lock up so much at one time, but that's okay. That's okay. And if there is it's no surplus. like funding retirement. That's right. the way I'm thinking. Right. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Because we don't know. I mean, we don't know what the contracts are going to look like. You don't know what the contributory is going to be. You don't know if things are going to switch over to us putting in a certain amount versus, I mean, we're still negotiating all those other contracts too, but that's okay. You, we can go with it. Hey, I just, hey, just hey, wanted to throw it out there for discussion, but. Hey, Bobby, it says plus up to 25%. So I assume there's some, there's some there's room some in there that there. we could, we could move that figure. Yeah, I agree. I see. All right. So, Mr. Marini, Mr. Marini or. Or Joe, do you guys agree that there's some room if, if, if it's not, you know, if we don't like the 25%, if we say, hey, you know, there was a $100,000 surplus and we only want to put 10% in there, we have that option because yes. of, because of the wording and, with up to? Yes. And it also, it also you know, um, I'll, I'll just say this. It's also a policy we're creating. So with, uh, you know, with discussion, it's something that we as a board can revisit as well in the future. Okay. So, okay. Know, but just putting that out there as well. It's just making sure we got it on paper for outside parties to see it and making sure that it's out there. For, okay. For, for, I'm good. Thank you. Those are our All right. are. But I'll second your motion, Tom. Thanks, Joe. So do you want to read, do you, uh, Trish, do you have that motion? I do. I do. Okay. Can you read it back? I She's can. Good. Alderman Mamone moved to adopt the OPEB trust fund policy as noted in the financial guidelines. Okay. And second by Alderman Yaman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Opposed. One of one opposition. Phipps. Any um, any uh, abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, guys. All right. And then the, uh, the the last piece is the debt policy and procedures, um, and that essentially spells out uh, the process in which the city would take on debt. Uh, things that it would be how it, how it would consider taking on debt and then the process that it would ultimately follow. Uh, so again, it's just a guideline um, to help you make decisions as you move forward. Make that motion to update that guideline for the debt service. I just could I oh. uh, I would like to make a suggestion as to uh, yeah just. So, as to the wording of your motion, Tony, I'd I mean, I, I agree. I, I'll second the motion, in fact. But mm -hmm. when it says debt policy and procedures, I just like the word guideline to be included in there, so it's noted there at the top of the document. I don't know if you'll amend. I will amend and include that. Thanks, uh, Joe. And then I'll second. You're, right. amend you're amending the title of the document to be debt policy and procedures guideline. Guidelines. 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 Okay. There you go. There you go. Done. There you go. Motion by Mamone, second by um, Yam. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion passes. Thank you, guys. This is Beth. Okay. Can I just? Okay, go ahead. You're muted, Beth. 
Yeah, these documents, I didn't have any of them as part of the Board of Aldermen packet. Can I just get copies of them to keep them in the meeting yeah. file? Yeah, I can send them to you. They came, they came in an email uh, last week, but uh, yeah, I'll send them to you. Are they okay. Hmm. I apologize. I'm still learning the uh, the process of, of things, so that's that's my fault. Pat. That's I just they weren't on the agenda. That's why I didn't know if it was. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, just a couple more things, quick. And you know, I said this was going to be fast, and that didn't turn out well. So, um, <clears throat> the city is currently on track to convert its existing bans into bonds. Uh, We're targeting a sale date of Wednesday, February third. Uh, so that will be making permanent all of the uh, bands that we have. It's a very positive interest rate environment, so it makes sense uh, for the city to lock in. We discussed this with our fin financial advisors as well as our underwriters, um, and we are moving forward with that. Uh, the new infinite vision system continues to be a challenge, but we're getting caught up rather quickly. Uh, we have the use of an extra employee from the library of the library being closed, we brought uh, one of the employees over who has some experience uh, and we've been able to, uh, to catch up quickly. I know that was something that was a bit of a concern at the last meeting. So that's being addressed and I expect that we will be 100% caught up by mid-February. Um, as you know, we filed an extension for the fiscal year 20 audit. Uh, we're working very closely with the auditors and expect to have, have that completed well in advance of the deadline. Uh, our October 20 grand list uh, will not be completed by the end of January. So we filed for an extension, which is something that you have done the past two years. Uh, we are bringing in additional resources to assist in getting this process done. Uh, I'm still in the process of determining why an extension is needed each year. The previous assessor uh, leaving in early December certainly did not help things, but was not the full cause. I'm trying to determine if it is a work product issue or if the staffing arrangement in the office needs some change, but I'll provide updates as I work through this process. Uh, the staff that were the, uh, excuse me, the help that we're bringing in um, is less than what we would pay the assessor had she still been here. So again, this is a, a process that will stay budget neutral. And then we will be adding two new enhancements to our paycheck systems. Paychecks is the payroll system that the city uses. Uh, we'll be implementing, uh, implementing, excuse me, an onboarding process starting March 1st. So we're going to be uh, automating all of that. So we'll be cutting down on the amount of paper. When we hire a new person, we'll be able to send them a link. Uh, the person will go in uh, securely and be able to fill out all their forms. Everything will be sent over before they uh, are employed. At the same time, we're also going to be able to do any training. Uh, as an example, sexual harassment training, we can make that part of the onboarding process. The employee would watch it and then get credit for that. And then we'll be implementing around April 1st, the time and attendance policy. Um, though, again, there'll be no more paper. Uh, this time and attendance policy will link in with the police department software as well as link in with the public works software. So we'll be receiving timesheets electronically and employees will also be requesting time off electronically as well. So again, we're trying to get break away from the the old way of doing things with paper. Uh, I found paychecks to be very functional. I think you guys made a great choice uh, in bringing paychecks on. They're very easy to work with. So we'll be expanding um, just some of the platform that we have with them. And as I said, those things will take place in March and April of this year. So with that, Mr. President, I will close my very short report. Yes, very short indeed. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Kurt tonight? I have just one, uh, uh, Josh. Um, we requested an extension on the filing of the uh, audit from last year. What is that extension date? I'm sorry? The extension uh, date that we were able to obtain for completing the audit. Gives us an extra month. What's that? So that's the end of what? This month? Uh, end of February, we have to. February. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And for clarity, that's to file the grand list, not necessarily the audit. Well, no, no, there, there's two extensions we filed for. One was for the fiscal 20 audit, and the other is for the October 20 grand list. Okay. So we filed for extensions for both. Okay, any other questions for Kurt tonight? All right, thank you. Thank you. Great report again.
Uh, so ends the uh, public official session. We'll move on to committee reports. Uh, Finance committee. Make a motion to pay all bills if deemed correct. Second. Second by Alderman Rivers. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, opposed? Abstain? <coughs> Perfect. Motion passes unanimously. Um, the temporary regional school study committee. Uh, Joe, do you have an update this month? Yeah, we're continuing to plug along, uh, making good progress. We're still discussing um, aspects of the financials as well as we still have a little bit of work to do on the equalization portion of it. Um, and then up comes governance probably starting in February. So I'm anticipating, um, we just laid out in a, uh, our basically time frame that was discussed at our last meeting. We're hopeful at this point in time, our, our charge is until February of 2022. Uh, we heard back from council from the State Board of Education requesting that we get the, you know, any um, submission to the State Board of Ed with regards to feasibility um, as quickly as possible is kind of Tony, Tony, we're getting feedback. Um, hey, Spigs. There you go. Can, can you uh, mute yourself? You're getting some yeah. All right. Thank Sorry you. about that. So we're getting. So his the, the advice there was to try to get any uh, any submission for um, approval to come back and possibly go to referendum to them, um, preferably around the April to August time frame. Um, it was discussed at our last meeting. Hopefully, getting that done no later than June. So we're hopeful that we will have something. I'm hopeful that we can get it done um, by May. Um, but worst case scenario, hopefully we'll have something that will be submitting to not only this board, but also the State Board of Education for um, possible uh, consideration. They'll have the ability to sort of uh, give us some feedback, if, you know, uh, if they have things that they don't like and they want to change with regards to our plan um, and determination as to feasibility, we'll have an opportunity to do that. But um, once that is done, if approved at the uh, State Board of Education level, it's sent back here to go to referendum within 45 days. So that's sort of the update. Um, one thing I will say is that there's been um, discussions with our state legislative delegation about trying to find um, additional funding um, for a regional school district if it were to occur, specifically a reimbursement for some of the construction costs for some of the schools that will need to be updated and um, expanded. Um, and there's been additionally, there's some other discussions about other funding and, and things like that, including a possible uh, you know, increases to ECS, other fund, other grants and things like that. But those are very preliminary. Um, so we've sort of had a working session with the legislative delegation and uh, we're actually following up with them to get some more feedback tomorrow. So um, that's the update. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Um, do we have any other uh, committee reports from the aldermen from this month? I know everyone was uh, enjoying uh, Christmas pies and whatnot, so. Um, We'll, we'll push the issue there, but any other committees? All right, great. Uh, moving on, the uh, municipal report. Um, vote did not meet in December, but they, they met uh, January 4th. So we have uh, the vote recommendations and comptroller approvals from the uh, January 4th in your packet. It's your pleasure. Make a motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve by Stroman. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Yaman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? All right, motion uh, carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, let's see. The land use, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, land use report for December. Motion to accept. Motion to accept the land report by Yaman. Second. Second. Second by Mamone. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Perfect. Motion carries unanimously. Um, tax collector report and request for refunds. Um, the December tax collector report. Make a motion to accept the tax collector report. Motion to accept the tax collector report by Mamone. Do we have a second? Second. second. Second by Stroman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? All right, motion carries unanimously. And then the um, 
uh, January 2021 um, refunds in the amount of $1,789.13 if found to be correct. So a motion. Motion by Mamone, second by Yaman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? Perfect. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, accidents and claims. We have three claims. Motion to refer to Corp Council all three claims. Motion to refer to Corp Council by Yaman. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Rivers. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? All right, motion carries. Uh, we also have um, two communications and one uh, late communication. So the first um, communication number one is from Mr. Brandon McTee of 24 Castle Lane. This was in your packet. Uh, and to summarize, this was um, seeking to combine the project fee for an amount of $1,450 for the residents of 22, 24, and 28 Castle Lane um, for a fill project involving the three properties. I'd like to make a motion to uh, authorize the land use department to accept that one fee of $1,450 for all three applications. A second. Motion by Yao and second by Phipps. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? All right, motion carries unanimously. Communication number two is from Raymond Sadlick, and there was a map in there. This was um, a request to purchase a strip of land, city land on Silver Hill Road. I move we refer that to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission for, for an eight, recommendation. Four. For an 824. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, motion by uh, Alderman Phipps. Second. 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 Second by Mamone. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, late communication number one. I have here somewhere. Oh, that's the matrimonial. That's the uh, came from G G and G G and W L L C. Um, this was a request from Massimo Andretta um, to purchase a uh, strip of city land next uh, abutting the property um, of the business on Main Street. What's your desire? I move uh, we refer that again to P and Z and also possibly the uh, police building commission too. I don't know how that would impact the the uh, parking lot uh, going forward. So uh, it was just a thought I had. Uh, okay. I want to have a touch on it. Second. I do know that it. it I mean, I I went and checked that. I checked all these out, but I know that that one is that tiny little strip next to the the wall there that's already coned off like that's not part of the parking lot but that's not a bad suggestion um so a motion by alderman phipps to uh refer to p and z and potentially to the uh police building commission we have a second 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 by rivers all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed abstention king, i'm opposed one opposed alderman king any abstentions tonight all right, um, motion passes, thank you. Um, we have one resignation. Um, can't, there, it's listed separately on the, um, on the sheet, on, on the agenda, but it was in one letter from uh, Mr. Michael Bettini, who was resigning from Inland Wetlands Commission and the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mr. President. Yes. I'd like to just, um, I'd like to make a motion to send uh, Mr. Bettini a letter of thanks, but I'd also like to say that um, I think his resignation is a loss to the city. He's knowledgeable, dedicated, and um, I think he is going to, it's going to be very difficult to duplicate him. So I would like to make that motion to send him a letter. Thank you. Um, do we have a second on that? Second. Second by Cassetti. 
Uh, all in favor of accepting this um, resignation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, there, there's also a third resignation listed on here from um, former Alderman Richard Casalitis uh, as an incident city marshal. Um, he indicated um, via phone call that he was going to resign. He's moved out of town, um, but we did not receive a letter yet, so we will not act on that. So um, look for that. Gosh, it's Beth again. Sorry. I received an email from him today, but I, I need the written resignation. Okay. Oh, he said he he said he was just going to email. So if you told an email him, is uh, written. No, you ha I have to have a, a written signature. Is Secretary it, of is State requires. Is an email signature considered um, viable? No. It depends if he actually submitted an electronic signature on the email, which I'm assuming he he didn't. Okay. The thing, it's an elected position, so it has, the vacancy has to be filled at a special meeting anyway, so you can accept the resignation. Okay, we were, right. when I, was, when I wasn't planning on filling it, I just was going to accept it, but yeah, I, didn't, no, I, right. I, I didn't realize it had come in. All right, motion to accept. I just got it today, so. Okay, motion to accept uh, Rich's resignation as uh, city marshal. Motion. Well, no, I don't. Motion yeah, by Ramon. Second. Second. Second by anybody? Bobby. It was Bobby. Bobby. Second second by Tar. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Rich, um, for your service. Good luck. I'd uh, like to make a motion to send Mr. Castellari's letter. Thank you for that. Yes. Second. Um, all in favor of doing that? Uh, Aye. All right. No option to say no on that one. Uh, let's see. Resignations. We have no appointments this month. Um, okay. Uh, old business. Um, there's one item listed on here. Um, the <laughs> IT manager salary increase. Um, that we discussed this back in uh, October at our meeting, Board of Aldermen meeting. And there was an addition. Is uh, Rich here? I know he was. He had worked on this. Rich Bashara. If he's not, yeah, I'm on. He's Rich. on. He's on. So I know that th this this was discussed. Uh, there was a resolution in October, uh, and it was essentially to convert the IT manager position from salary to hourly. Um, in the I think the one thing that jammed it up a little bit. Um, was that there was no uh, listing in the resolution for the number of hours. So um, can we accept the, can we refer to the original resolution and just add the hours, amend it with the hours? Yeah, the way the discussion went, uh, my understanding was that to go to $35 per hour up to a maximum of 29 and a half hours per week. And that it was not, uh, necessary that it would be all of those, but it could go up that high. Yeah. And everything except for the 29.5 hours maximum was in the original resolution. It was the IT manager, the current salary, yes. the, the new rate of 35 hours, but someone, I remember mentioning that there was no cap on it. Um, so can we um, accept that resolution? Uh, amending with 29.5 hours as a, as a uh, cap. Yeah, if you could do that. Yeah, I believe the total cap on that was about $53,000, but um, you know, it's, you could multiply it out 29 and a half times 35 times 52 weeks. That would be your cap number. Yeah. Well, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that embedded in the position itself? Not necessarily the, the salary. So, you know, I, I kind of brought this up before. Why don't we just change it to whatever the current hourly rate is and let, you know, the, the, the folks at City Hall manage, you know, what it is. Obviously, if, if, if the gentleman is needed for, you know, additional hours or whatever, the, the process is in place, the budget has to be there or whatever. Do we necessarily need a cap on this, you know, if you have personnel folks, budget folks, whatever, finance folks watching this as, as it needs to? Turn it to hourly and just let it be what it is. The 29 and a half is the cutoff between full-time, part-time. 
I think over 30 hours can he be considered a full-time employee. And so that was the reason for the cutoff, I believe. Is anyone else enjoying Rich's trippy background and half dead? Yeah, I thought my he fell there for a minute. <laughs> I thought he had fallen. It was my granddaughter's birthday, and I'm on my phone this time. So you're falling Sorry. into your background. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, hey, Josh, I just have a question. Did this come to us from the personnel committee? This came from um, I'm trying to look and see where this was. A previous salary committee. Yeah, previous salary committee, then it came to the full board and never got never got any further. October 13th Board of Aldermen meeting, we discussed an actual resolution that had come from uh, the salary committee and who had worked with the finance department. So it did come to okay. All right. Yeah. And I believe uh, the original discussion, which was in the mayor's office and with other people. Uh, had this retro back to, I think, August 24th. That's how long we've been discussing this. Okay, so what's our, what's the uh, pleasure here? To me, I think, I think, I feel like this would have gone through the last time had that, had a cat been on there, but people mentally uh, calculated it out and it was like 80,000, I think was, you know, if, if it was a 40 hour, you've said that 29.5 is the top, is the cap for, uh, part time, so uh, to me that alleviated any of the worry we have. So um, I have the original resolution here somewhere. Put it back up. Um, any? Uh, does anyone want to just uh, roll with this, or is, are there any other comments, questions? Why I look for this? Just the, the only concern that I have is: is there a is there a budget implication on this? Like, what is it? What is the the position budgeted at now? And then, if we start applying a retro to it, are we going to cause any sort of salary deficit because it's unbudgeted? Uh, it's budgeted, I believe, at thirty thousand for this year. Um, it was actually budgeted in prior years before we made it salary. That was budgeted at like $38,000. And with the uh, going to salary, it was dropped down. Uh, in terms of whether it will put us in a deficit position, it may be a little bit, but uh, as far as I know, Dave still is only working about 20 hours a week unless uh, something extraordinary comes up. So normally he's only in at his 20 hours. Uh, the cap is there for um, back in normal times where he may be doing a bunch of other different things. And you know, he, he does a great job. He's, he's there at nights, he's there at days, he's there weekends. So it's kind of a, a job that he'll, he'll respond whenever needed. And again, with computers, you kind of have to go when, when something happens. Uh, you know, I've seen him down there uh, with a, a power outage at 10 o'clock at night down there restarting the servers and getting things ready for the morning, that kind of a thing. So uh, he, he's always on call. All right, the, the, only, the only other thing based on what um, Josh is showing on the screen, Josh, you have an effective date of October. Rich, you mentioned August. Well, when the, the discussion, when we first did discuss this, mm -hmm. the, the notes I had, because I went back to my notes from that meeting, and it was to change the $35 retroactive to August 24th. So what are we taking? Are we taking the October or are we going to take the August? Well, that's up to you to decide. Well, it's what's written, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to go with the written, Diane. So I'm, I'm going to, I don't know whose TV is cranked up either. That's, but King, that's King. Dan needs to mute. Hey, Dan. There you go. Uh, I'm sort of, in, I mean, um, I know that this, that discussion went way back. I mean, because I've been in a loop on that, but because it's written in the original resolution, I would be comfortable with accepting the resolution retroactive to October 13th with the amendment of the 29.5 hour cap. Um, I'll be, make that motion to accept that resolution from October 13th with the cap noted. Okay, do we have a second? Second, that? second by Cassetti. I think he just yes yeah okay your face is white i couldn't see if your lips were moving yeah. it's just 
blaring. Right as a ghost. There you Oops. go. There you go. All right. So a motion in a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Work on that. And uh, so uh, and thank you, guys. Motion carries unanimously. Um, all right. We do have a, a second uh, piece of old business um, that's not on the agenda, but I've, I, can, I guess I'll go back to it. This, last month in public session, there was a request uh, for, uh, in a letter from Diana Carasquillo. This was the request to place a geocaching um, spot up at uh, up in the bush in Nolan Field. There was a map in there. Um, the she spoke to us, but we hadn't received the letter yet. Then we received the letter. Um, I checked with uh, Jeff Coppola uh, in recreation, and I checked with uh, Corporation Council if there was any liability, and uh, both both seemed very supportive of that. Um, and she was not seeking to to start this until sometime in the spring, but I thought it would be nice if we could uh, we could approve this uh, request. And uh, at least she would have that approval going forward. So moved. Motion by uh, Cassetti. Do we have a second on that? Second. Second by Stroman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? I'd, I'd abstain from it. One abstention uh, by Phipps. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, that's it. Um, we have executive session. I'd like to remove item number three from the executive session that was resolved uh, internally. Um, so we have three items, number one, two, and four. Um, do we have a motion to move into executive session? Motion to move into executive session, eliminating Ready? item number three. All right. Second. Alderman Cassetti, do we have a second? Second. Second by Yaman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. Let's roll. All right. Uh, now the real fun begins. We have to transfer to the other room. Yes. Session. We lost Diane again. Oh. I'll second it then. <laughs> <laughs> She's stuck in room two. It can't be. Yes. We lost. Wait, hang on, hang on. There is yeah, no die. Right? Returning to Main Get her on the phone. Did you say, did it say leaving now? Leaving now, return. There she and is. Did you hit it? She's here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so we're back, right? Okay, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> For the fourth <laughs> time. Oh, What's going to come out of executive session? Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Motion by Cassetti, second by Rivers. All in favor to return to regular session? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So we had three items uh, from executive session. I'll just read them off. Uh, in the case of Diaz versus City of Ansonia. I'd like to make a motion to authorize Corp Council to proceed as discussed. Second. second. Motion by Yaman, second by Rivers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. In the uh, case of Fryer versus City of Ansonia. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the Land Use Department and Council if necessary to proceed as discussed in executive session. That was Fryer? Fryer, yep. Motion by Yaman. Second. Second by Mamone, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, and in the case of 10 Holbrook Court, Blightlean. Oh, I, back, I did those backwards then. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's, yeah. We got to reverse that. Go back. Right. So that motion, is, that motion is for Holbrook, Trish. 10 oh, Holbrook we do the motion. Authorized land use. Is for, is for the is for Holbrook. Holbrook. Does everyone agree with that? I'll still yeah. second it. Yes. Okay, and and everyone is still in favor. Still in favor. Yeah. Is there any anybody opposed? That was uh, number four. We did discuss them out of order. Sorry about that. I should have read them out of order. Then. All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And then going back That's to Chicago number, school. And then going back to number two, Fryer versus City of Ansonia. Motion to authorize council to proceed as discussed. All right. So second on that. One. Second by Mamone. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
All right. Favorite part. Motion to adjourn. I made Chicago. Motion, motion by Chicago. Second. Second. Second by Mamone. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice uh, good night. Everybody. Stay safe. Have a good night. Thank you.